and the enemy like, team, oh, you're too, you're too powerful now. The enemy team cuts the band so they don't have a chance to sling themselves back in. And CLG, <laughs> then you hit yourself in the eye. <laughs> didn't quite get an opportunity to answer back in uh, Phoenix One. Didn't get an opportunity to answer back in game number two. But as you can see, we've entered into picks and bands for game number three between CLG and Phoenix One. Shen, Lissandra, Twisted Fate, Band Away, one top, two mid, along with Azir, Rise, and Vladimir, and immediately, Xmithy goes straight for that Rek'Sai. Yep, wasn't first pick last time, it was the Karma first pick for CLG, the previous time that they were blue side. The bands then were Shen, Lissandra, and Ash, and then Azir, Rise, and Vladimir. So, the only thing that's left up is that Twisted Fate, P1 on red side, they could go back to the Twisted Fate like they did in game one, but it'll be way further down in the draft. But they're going to take the Karma for now. Mm -hmm. Flex pick, uh, sometimes it goes to Pyrian, and sometimes it goes to Mash, but we will see. Because right now, it's takeaway from CLG, so Aphromoo doesn't have that. Yeah, that Elise locked in as well for... Do my eyes deceive me? No, it's an Ori in the lobby. It's not Sentinel. I'm looking down there. It actually is an Ori, yes. Yes, and in our champ select, it is in fact Inori. So, a little bit of bug with the labeling, but don't let that fool you, everyone. That's Inori, the jungler for Phoenix One. Still, no swaps going out. Yeah, um, I, I mean he's not even here. <laughs> yeah, like Zentinel had to fly back home. Exactly. So, but going back to that Elise, when he doesn't play the Hecarim or the Olaf, he has returned to that Elise and Rek'Sai, and with Rek'Sai off the table, he goes back for that standard jungler. However, CLG. They're going to get the opportunity to look back at that Sivir that Stixay had a pretty good performance despite being picked on in the early game. Yeah, and CLG, they're just really good at rotating, so why not just give yourself the ability to rotate even faster? If you are identifying that there's a rotation available half a second earlier, and then it's all about travel time, well, boom, you get there much faster than them, and it looks like this gigantic gap where P1 just looked lost. And that's what they're going for here, because P1 have drafted more of a pick comp here yeah. uh, with the Karma with the Elise, the Cocoon, and the follow-up from the Arrow. So P1 have a lot of ways to start fights, and it was talked about on the desk where they need a lot of go buttons, like everybody to press them, so that the team fight is going to start. And they just have to draft either a support or mid laner to round out this composition. Yeah, this is exactly, as you said, what Crumbs was talking about. Give yourselves clear ways to engage with the enemy team, clear ways to force these fights in your favor. Ash is how Mash is going to do it this time. And more importantly, while he's split pushing, he can still have global presence on the map <laughs> by firing that arrow. So we'll see if CLG will have the reflexes to dodge it. Sivir, of course, able to spell shield. But getting to those final picks, it's Aurelia and Cassiopeia locked mm. in for who he. Last time we saw him take it, he made a couple of questionable choices. Let's hope he can recover this time. Yeah, it's a low mobility, high damage dealing mid laner here for who he. And if he gets hit by an arrow, he's probably going to take that cleanse uh, because Cocoon, Arrow, all these things can really mess him up. But if you draft a mid laner for yourself here, trying to think like if, if you do know how to play Talia you can mess, you can really wreck Cassiopeia uh, also the option that she doesn't shouldn't have access to early boots so you if you buy early Swifties she is way slower than you but it could just be yep yeah final pick is gate Braum locked in so they are just going to stick with that karma flex pick in the mid lane Kyrian taking a bit of a utility role Previously, he played Twisted Fate and Azir. Mm -hmm. so we haven't seen him play Utility in a couple a couple of games. Yeah, and that means that Pyrian doesn't is he he isn't going to have that same type of pressure that he had in the previous two games. Uh, we'll see what he does on this. I'll be interested to see what his build is. People have been favoring the Athenes and the Ardent Sensor. Yeah, uh, but there are still alternate builds out there. We've seen people still go for things like Ludens. CDR early. So Phoenix One placing all of their eggs in the layer CC and get pick basket. Yep, it's the pick potential. You have a four-man unit. If Zig gets ahead and he's able to bully out Darshan, then he's good. Uh, having a Cassiopeia alongside a Sivir and Bard, incredibly potent. Uh, Sivir combined with Cassiopeia, or even a Karma combined with Cassiopeia, is just she has so much ability to increase her movement speed that she becomes a force to be reckoned with. And she doesn't have a gap closer, but yeah. at that point she does.
effectively being able to chase into the enemy team. But we are about to decide the match in this game three. Show off your smarts and predict the winner on Twitter. Use hashtag CLG win or hashtag P1 win as the teams load onto the rift and get ready for this game three, this ace match between Counter Logic Gaming and Phoenix One. Teams now racing out of base. Phoenix One currently on a two match winning streak, looking for that third win to try to head towards that final playoff spot. But pressure is mounting, and they're going to have to be able to beat out CLG here to be able to do it. And CLG is one of the teams competing for that playoff spot. Yeah, haven't secured their own. Coming back from MSI and doing better than any North American team had ever done uh, internationally in a Riot tournament. High expectations for CLG, but now they're underdogs again. I mean, I guess CLG's at full power when they're underdogs, though. <laughs> it's our doubt that as fuels as, them. It, it's weird, because as soon as uh, everybody starts believing they'll do well, it's uh, counter logic, and they start doing very poorly. <laughs> and then when you think they're doing poorly, then they just turn it around. Staying true to their name. Counter Logic Gaming, having a competitive series with Phoenix One here in this game three, hoping to show that they can take these wins and advance closer towards that final playoff spot. I say final. There, there are a handful as those middle of the pack teams are actually packed rather close. Mm -hmm. There's a couple still up for grabs, mm -hmm. of course. But now taking a look at this game right here, two minutes in, we are seeing a lane swap initiated by Phoenix One. And CLG look to do the same. They're Gates actually going to they're gonna catch him out. Oh, he's stunned up against the wall. Exhaust is dropped as well. They're going to try to burn through his health. He's healing. He's still got Flash. There's a long way for him to go. Mash will be able to land the slow. They're still chasing. First Blood sticks a heal. Wasted by Mash as well. The Flash point blank Q to reset. That was sick. Right in front of his face. That's just instant burst damage there. Didn't even use like an auto attack reset like W. It's just boom, boom. And the fact that the Q made contact with his model immediately. And then really well played there. Just, that was sneaky. No, that sticks set. No, it's sneaky. Darshan is going to chase on the Zig now. Level two means he can get a pretty favorable trade. But Zig, confident in his turret range, will be able to trade back. Double hunting, uh, corrupting potion for Darshan heals him back up. Yep, and you gotta be confident now if you're CLG. Your early game just once again back in your favor. CLG game one also got first blood onto, I believe it was an. Uh, no, sorry. To get back. Oh. Different, different series, but hold on. Big Smithy once again, exactly at the two minute 50 second mark. Ganks mid. Inori now roaming bottom. Darshan's got flash. Zig. Oh, he's got mega. But Cocoon hits. Oh, they flash forward. They're gonna try to chase him down. Do they have enough damage? Phoenix one answer back with a kill of their own. And Zig does not go down there, but recognize that he doesn't have red buff. And Smithy goes to the other side of the map, tries to capitalize on that, tries to get something back here. Trying to make something for nothing. And Smithy will be able to secure this. Dershawn actually teleports right back in. It's a gigantic wave, he can't miss it. And Zig is gonna hang out. There is Experience. Well. Oh, who he's actually roaming towards the top. There is a ward yeah, just over four the wall. Man, roam. Zig has to back. Zig has TP. He has to use it right now. It's been there. He's right teleporting now too. up. Gates trying to block some of these, and immediately there's a magical journey. Teleport. Oh, Zig actually teleported bottom. Ooh. They're diving on the Darshan stun. Means he's got to repel and reset aggro and Ori. Woo! A lot he's of damage. They're diving top once again. The teleport was canceled, and they Six follow up with the next wave. 6A did trade his life over for MASH, but Gate's still there. Who Smithy's thinking about it. Yeah, he nobody had tagged Gate first, so if he had autoed there, he was a dead man. Yeah. But they kill off the AD carry again, so MASH struggling in the CS department, whereas Stixa, once again, has both kills, so he's able to pick up a BF sword, and now MASH has a cull Ooh. in boots, and way less damage. Somebody got caught window shopping. Aframu will finally be able to get out of this, but so far this game has been blow for blow. Four minutes, kill for kill, and then another trade. And it's dead even, about 500 gold lead for CLG. Very, very close. Yeah, and now you lane swap. Make sure that your AD carry with your cull goes into a lane. They said, okay, let's get him some free farm. 
has to cancel the TP uh, because otherwise he would have three people run mid and then he wouldn't have a way back. But because he canceled it, four show up, who he has no mana left, gets the last little blow there, and Stixe gets the kill. Has to blow his heal too. Yeah, Stixe taking turn aggro for the first auto. Not quite right. Yep, not ideal, but it happens. He ends up going for his second kill and dies as well. He is yep. able to open the game with a BF sword, though, and Mash on the opposite side of the map started with a Cull and Boots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he started with the uh, the Doran's Blade on both sides, and then he picked up the Cull because he's like, all right, uh, screw this. We're going to swap. I'm going back down bottom. Let's make it be the, the lane swap mm -hmm. uh, just later on in the game. And that's what the Cull is going to help him out with, is get that burst of gold later. This sets up a bit of a scary situation for Phoenix One because whenever Mash gets in this sort of men's mindset, sometimes he gets in his own head. He'll end up split pushing most of the game, saying, I have to get up, I have to catch up in CS. CLG, they just might be able to take advantage off of this as they shove and try to take down that top tier one, yeah. even giving over that solo experience to Darshan. Oh, yeah, Darshan also up 10 CS right now. Uh, Zig not in the bottom side of the map, uh, getting experience. I mean, that's supposed to be the top laner's territory. After the lane swap, you're supposed to be able to pick up some solo experience, and that's the beauty of it. Uh, but Zig now two levels down. Uh, pretty much one level, actually, because he's very close to hitting four. And Avram was just chilling here. The hat is backwards, Zyrene. He has turned it around. Toothpick ready. Zyrene is trying to go... Uh, hey, Zyrene. Afro is trying to go hard this game. What, what am I trying to do? <laughs> trying to go hard. Okay. Win the game. Let's go. Let's go. But that's why I'm not a player, because <laughs> I can't, I can't. All righty, six and a half minutes in, CLG lead by 800 gold, slowly increasing that advantage by denying Zig in the top yeah. lane and uh, trying to split some of that gold. Oh, flash from Hoohee to get the way. Yeah, Zig is uh, kind of getting left out to dry here. That, that wave is not going to get much better for him. Uh, I'm going to go check up on it real quick. So Darshan's pushing it forward, but this is a cannon minion coming up, and this is a freeze towards CLG. Like Zig's, Zig's not going to get anything for a good while here. Jungler on the opposite side of the map. Like, this feels awful as a top laner. You're like, normally you're supposed to be on the other side of the map after the lane swap. Uh, uh, unlucky? Uh, <laughs> we've, seen Zig, please? we've seen Zig on Nar play for the team before, so... Just having to bite the bullet here and really yeah. take the loss, that's got to feel pretty bad. Yeah, it didn't end up the the way that Darshan could have made it happen, but yeah. it, it's going to be pushing out uh, eventually back towards CLG, but it's just a big enough wave now because Darshan was throwing a bunch of autos and actually picking stuff up uh, instead of true freezing it. Eventually, he will be able to catch some of those minions, but for now, he's two levels down, about mm -hmm. 30 behind. CLG try to invade the blue buff, knowing they've got pressure in the bottom lane. Ixmithy even going to smite, but Inori tries to punish him. But there's not quite a fast enough response from the rest of Phoenix 1. The blue gets stolen. There's nothing that they can do. Yeah, I actually think if you flat out fight here on the bottom side of the map, that is way in favor of CLG, because if both top laners TP, Zig was level 4, Darshan level 6, uh -oh. And this top lane wave would be missed out on. As soon as he leaves turret range, he's just going to get jumped on. He doesn't even have jungler there. Uh, he's going to try to slow him, try to combo this chase down. If he gets the hyper off, no. It's still, not fast enough. Still a few seconds before uh, Darshan can leap back in. Arrow onto Xmithy as he's going to zone and dive bottom onto Phoenix 1. Gate unbreakable blocks a lot. Xmithy's stunned, but it takes the journey far, far to safety. Very scenic journey. Darshan warding over the wall as well on the top side to check out if the Elise is nearby. And Inori was on that top side picking up his red buff. Just clearing out that side of the map. So full knowledge here of where the members of P1 are. And that's going to give CLG this bottom turret. Yeah, they continue to pressure that bottom tier one and take that turret. That's going to be a 2,000 gold lead for Counter Logic Gaming. Nine minutes in as they clear that out. And Phoenix won. Despite having defensive warts, despite trying to play the same early game that they played in the pre, uh, previous two ma uh, uh, games, aren't getting the opportunity. To. CLG are just being so insistent with this pressure. Yeah, they've won every early game so far uh, off of just taking turrets and structures. They make it look rather easy to take these turrets mm -hmm. from P1 uh, because they're just exploiting the pre-team fight phase, and it's one of P1's weakest points because you have to be able to communicate with your jungler where you need him, where he needs to be, where you need to be, 
Uh, and why, honestly? Because it's like, oh, th this is a freeze top, or he's pushing down a long lane, and Elise isn't here. Like, that top lane could have been Darshan pushing past his halfway point, and nobody on his team can join him because there's no teleports or anything. So, it's really a, uh, a lack of execution on these communities. The lack of communication and lack of uh, seeing the opportunities. Darshan with the best feeling wave clear. And you, I think you wait for Braum. You wait for Braum. Wait for Braum. Gates up there as well. There they go. Flash. Oh, the cocoon misses. Uh, Tempered Fate, Pyrian flashes as well. So CLG immediately react in another lane, setting up a play of their own. But now they see Inori on the top side, and that's a Mountain Drake. Yeah, Mountain Drake for CLG, most likely here. Uh, but this top turret, finally going to equalize them. If you want to look to take this one down. Yep. And zone Darshan off of him, creeps. Ash and Pyrian are actually sharing CS in the mid lane right now. That's... Even more of a deficit to Phoenix One trying to defend against Hoogie's pressure on this Cassiopeia. And still, CLG, one full step ahead, not only taking that turret, but also taking that Drake. And oh, Zig finally going to be able to try to deny this. Mash is looking for an arrow. Mash is trying to get an arrow to hit uh, Hoogie. Because if he cleanses the arrow, you're still probably going to get the follow up of the uh, Karma W. But he's chilling, hanging out in the. Uh, on the side, clearing out vision. Yeah, and all cool and all. Rift Herald is up. They could try to look to take this. Afro moves over there as well. Darshan does have his teleport, so we could try to leap across the map. But instead, they just try to commit to the swap. Xmithy. Oop, there's a ward there. Oh, yeah. He's still going to go in, though. As Rek'Sai, you don't, you're not always privy to that knowledge. And nice little juke there from uh, Kyrian, but it's not nice enough. Yeah, that debilitating poison. And the sad arrow. A sad arrow. In memoriam, shots fired. But yeah. now CLG are going to pressure this Ooh. mid lane. They managed to catch Kate. Holy cow. They destroy him. Yeah. Who he's doing really well right now against Pyrian. Uh, got an advantage. Had people show up to the mid lane and start camping for him. And this is why it's such a mid lane focused meta. Because you can see how much damage he can do on this champion. Like, these mid laners are really stacked in terms of how much damage they do at all stages of the game. Continuing to press forward, and Nori gets carved up as well. CLG. They yeah. want their cake. They want to win this game. Hui's doing a really good job of also landing those poisons, landing the uh, Miasma so they can't flash away with the grounded mechanic. Oh, Pyrian steps forward to dodge that tempered fate. Able to avoid that one. But CLG take two turrets and in their most convincing lead yet, 13 minutes in. They've got a four and a half thousand gold lead. Yeah, very quick. It's 13 minutes in, like you said. This is insane. Like, they're just taking over this early game. They got that. It is just from pretty much level one as well. Yeah. I loved how Aphromu was just sitting there by that blue buff, and he set it up, yep. right? Knew that Gate was going to walk up. Mash ditched it uh, and walked away because it's the standard thing to do. But CLG have always done this, even last split and the split before that, when there's a really common level one that happens, they find the counter to it. They find what nobody else has done and try to pick up a kill through it. I remember when uh, it was like Double Lift's Callista cutting the minion wave in a lane swap. Yeah. Which is really strange to do, and, and you think it's really risky, but if everybody's playing standard and then you do that, then you get away with it. It ends up denying quite a lot. CLG very oh. decisive in this game. Pyrian. Going to try to collapse on a period again. The Void Rush from three directions they collapse onto him. He still has no flash. Another kill for Huhi. 2 0 and 3. Xmithy is going to head off Inori at the pass, but red buff means he can repel the safety. Yeah, he's going to try to start it up as well, but all of CLG are oh, collapsing up here. Darshan collapses, yeah. He's the only one left out. CLG making the very aggressive calls that. They've sort of been missing. He's going to try to find Zig solo. Lead forward, gets the stun over the wall. He's got flash, but decides not to chase despite having vision. Yeah. Darshan actually just flashes a little bit off, and it's, oh, almost, yeah. it's almost up. Yeah, right. yeah it's okay. <laughs> the, the top of it is a little bit uh, the same color anyway. It's Whoa. not like completely grayed out, right? Like, yeah. yeah the, it, it's weird, but also... House. Gate is dead arena. Uh, yes, so is Inori, 
and Maybe mash. Ooh, mash gets slowed. There's the boomerang, debilitating poison. Smithy gets another kill. CLG are slaughtering Phoenix One. This is this is what CLG fans were hoping for. Whoa, Darshan tries to one v one, but it's a one v two. It's the worst one v one I've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> of all time, all time. But yes, going back to that gate walks forward. It looks like a bait, but. Whoa, everybody's there. Arrow comes out, doesn't matter. And then they're all over the place to go in after the support. Mash wasn't really on the follow, or on the immediate uh, engage. And it's an Ash as well. Like, he, he throws the hawk shot at them. <laughs> <laughs> I had this the entire time. It's like, <laughs> I'll have you know I could have scouted that push. I could have done it. I could have done it. <laughs> Mind games from Phoenix One, but it's 16 minutes in. That's a 6,000 gold lead. It keeps getting bigger and bigger as CLG are taking this game and running with it. Now looking to secure Rift Herald. And Phoenix One are just falling further and further behind. They're trying to make the decisive plays, but CLG, they figured it out. They figured out Phoenix One's formula and are answering appropriately. Yeah, they've been able to own the early game every game mostly off the back of uh, where Smithy's ganking, and also Aphrom was doing a really good job of these rotations. And the Bard, combined with the Sivir, just gives them so much oh. power to do so and get around the map. And they did it last game, and it was the winning formula. Now they're going to go back to top lane, scene of the crime. Oh, another one. The Cocoon is going to hit Aphrom. He goes down, shut down. He had three kills. However, who he catches up, targets Mash, and who he slices through Phoenix One. X Smithy, despite being at 400 health, chases forward, gets a good knockup. Cocoon finds Stix A Zig, kiting on the far side. Phoenix One trying to outplay this. There's the debilitating poison. Pyrian's gonna take a lot of damage, but slow means who he can't chase. Darshan on the side finds Inori. And CLG trade two for one and back off. There's just so much damage from CLG. You have Stixe with the early Infinity Edge, and they didn't buy like a Zeal item earlier. So every time he crits, you just see it oh, devastate them. Stixe, oh, Stixe trying to recall on a ward gets basically handed over to Phoenix One. Okay. Can they do this? Yeah, they gotta be careful of here comes, here comes Pyrian. Teleport for Darshan to collapse onto a Nori. Pyrian teleports in. He's still got no health and no mana. Zig dueling it out with Huhi on the bottom. Slams him against the wall, but now he's got anything, nothing else. Darshan trying to get in. He's gonna land the slow. Will he go down? Yes, Mash gets him over the wall. A CLG gate out, fighting off a little bit more than they can chew. Yeah, and that's what happened last time as well, is P1. They get you on the backs. You think you're safe? You're like, ah, we won the fight. And it's like, <laughs> nope. By the way, we're still around, and then they use TP to get in. Pyrian gets the heal off uh, with his uh, Athenes. Yeah, Pyrian teleported in with like 700 health. Yeah, he's basically like, I'm here for the heal. Cocoon hits ah. Aphromu. Perfect pick up there, but this right here hits Gate. Smithy comes over the wall, gets the knockup on the Mash. Mash can't uh, do anything, doesn't even have Flash. They all come over the side, and then Stixa just does so much damage, but Luhi as well. The change is Cassiopeia, making it so that you don't even need to land your Q. You just press E very, very rapidly. It does more damage when you land your Q. Oh, yeah. It does. But it's just always a... More than twice as much damage if you if the target is poisoned. Yeah, it's just a fraction of a cooldown, a fraction of a second in cooldown at yeah. all times. 0.9 second base, 40% cooldown reduction, about to 0.6. But... That CLG now securing the second Drake, Ocean Drake, 18 minutes and 45 seconds in. Next one will be another Mountain Drake. CLG trying to control these neutral objectives as Darshan says, 1v1 me, bro. We didn't get to 1v1 last time. Because you brought in help. And, and he's, he's like, doing it again. He's like, all right, 1v1, 1v1. All right, I see, I see. I see, I'm almost changing. Darshan better be keen to this. He's he's yeah. He's like, already why back would away. the Nar walk <laughs> back up at half health and after he flashed too? Yeah, we we've, we've seen teams trade like this before to try to trick Darshan into picking up a few kills. Envy did it yesterday, but CLG are able to respond appropriately and use Darshan's aggression to pressure that bottom tier two and secure it for themselves. Five turrets to two, back to a six thousand gold lead despite all of those kills. From Phoenix One. Yeah, it seems kind of familiar. Uh, seems like the last game, or even the game before that. The game oh, before that, especially. Tempered game eight. One. CLG want to fight, but they find four. A little bit more. Yeah, it's just on Zig. I, I feel like you don't take it at. 
Darshan doesn't have teleport either, so you'd be picking a five on four, like you said. Not quite a desirable mm -hmm. fight. As Zig trying to keep pace with Darshan. He's going to continue farming up down about 30 CS right now. Inori down 40. Mash is down only about 15, but a lot of kills on the sticks. That gives him more than an ample gold advantage. The CLG, they're priming. They're looking for fights, looking for picks. Uh, and what I really like about CLG's comp in this game is, the, sure, they can go for those picks, but they can also beat P1 at their own game because it's a better team fighting composition. Yeah. P1, their team fight is really Zig and a little bit of Gate. Everything else is, you know, Runan's Hurricane on Ash, and then it's all pick. All of their CC is really pick pick potential. Like, you're just looking to catch somebody out, deny vision. And if CLG just want to group up as five or have the 4-1 split push happen and then TP in, like, you're just going to get beaten. But P1 have shown that they love the team fight. Like, that's how they win the game is they team fight you and they win at that. And so CLG just picked a better comp to do the, the same thing that P1 is trying to do stylistically. But there's the pick. There's the pick. They start stacking the CC. Do they have enough damage? Afro flashes and journeys to safety. Xmitty, though. Yeah. He takes a lot as well. And Ori oh. chases. He doesn't even go through the journey. Oh, red buff burning, but the exhaust is not enough. Who he and Stixay are able to pick up the kill. Continuing to chase now onto Anori. What a crit. Double kill. Three members. Phoenix one dead. Yeah, Phoenix one tried to start that off with the arrow and the pick. You need to get somebody very quickly. You saw their damage output. They weren't able to kill Aphromoo, and then they all went on to Xmithy, and they weren't able to kill him either. And this might be barren for CLG, and they're going to try to rip the game wide open. Yeah, there's no smite. This is the play that cost Phoenix won the game in the previous one. Tempered Fate, Zones Mash away. He tosses out the arrows, but it's not enough. CLG secure the Baron. And CLG, they want to put the stamp on this game and say, you know what, that first one didn't mean anything. They don't even kill him. The support utility mid laner. Karma, and then the wow. triple petrifying gaze. We had to watch uh, Inori go down there and try to attempt to get those kills when the action was happening. Yeah. But then Stixe and Huhi out of nowhere layer it up and show that they can do the damage. Huhi, that's the Cassiopeia that he wanted to play yesterday, not the face checking a bush with three people in it. When you face check it, then you stun them all, right? <laughs> well, that was the idea. That's that's the plan. Doesn't always go as planned. Yeah. 22 and a half minutes in, CLG, 9,000 gold ahead of Phoenix One with Baron buff. In all three games, they've controlled the early game. This time looks to be their smoothest rendition yet. But they're now pressuring that top tier two turret while Darshan pressures bottom. Phoenix One, will they be able to defend long enough to hold out for the late game? Uh, the late game is getting further and further away from them. Oh, yeah. Like, when do we hit late game? I guess it's when we both have six items, because CLG are 10k up at 23 minutes. Uh, Astronomical amounts of gold in terms of an advantage. And Zig, you, you can't fight this. Darshan's healing up the wall up the wrong way, but still inside of the hitbox. Wait, Darshan's not done! That sends a message, if anything ever does, and CLG chase forward. Burian forced to flash back, but Darshan! He goes for the stun. He's gonna end up going down, lands the stun. Mash gets a kill, but that's three members of Phoenix One dead. Four people of CLG are still up. They're gonna clear out this inhibitor. They've got minions. They're gonna keep going. I think they're gonna get damage onto this turret and try to close it out. Oh, Tempered Fate, Repel dodges. Xmithy is gonna land. There's nowhere for Inori to go, but the target is Gate, the bait himself. And are they going to burn through an ace for CLG? They're on the Nexus turret, and they're looking to take the game before anyone can respawn. This is what CLG were hoping for. The what? commanding Four win. 24 minutes, as you said, they are going to take the Nexus and take the victory over Phoenix One. And Phoenix One stay at two wins and CLG put themselves in that pack of six wins apiece yeah and hit the 500 mark with six and six and they're trying to stop that slump they're trying to get back up there game one showed some hints as to why they're in that position that they're in still fighting for a playoff spot instead of being that incredibly dominant team yeah but the games two and three when you were able to play through Huki, when you're able to get your sticks a ahead your 80 carry mm -hmm. then it, everything looks 
really good for this team. It's, it's like we got to see this growth happen in person over the course of this series. Game one, they made those mistakes, they controlled that early game, but then in game two, they cleaned it up, tightened it up, picking up more of an advantage, and then in game three, they looked the sharpest they had yet to secure the final series, uh, the final game and the match itself. And as you said, now 50-50 in the standings at six and six, CLG looking to rise up and chase the three peat. They've got their work cut out for them. But if that game three is any indication, they just might be able to do it. Yeah, it's a competitive NALCS at the top, and CLG are trying to get back up there. Mm -hmm. Darshan said it's not how you start, it's how you end. Playoffs is, is what matters, but making it to playoffs, what they have their eyes on right now mm -hmm. and improving. P1, they're all about improving as well right now, and they still have playoffs within their grasp. It's just going to take them a little bit more effort to get there in the place that they're currently at. We saw their early games not going their way. Shore up some macro play. Yeah. Also, uh, I think that, like, in terms of improvement, I think that Huhi today showed that oh, yeah. Victor and Cassiopeia are picks that we should probably be seeing a little bit more of. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, feel like the, I feel like the support mid laners, the utility mid laners right now are, are a big crutch uh, that you lean on. And I, I think it's just deceptive because it's just making your legs weaker for when you want and for when you need to get back on them later. Mm -hmm. And another uh, person that we were a little bit interested in, Darshan, who has been having a little bit of trouble lately, he's showing that, hey, I still can be that rock in the mid lane. He's still not quite at that MSI level, the 1v10 god, but we'll, we'll see if he can make it back up there. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. I think that uh, Darshan and who he is well, they're, they're going to have to step up as, this, as the season continues. And Stixay, you know, he was showing signs in this series that he could really carry the team uh, mm -hmm. when he's given resources. And when Huhi is also a threat, then it takes pressure off of him and he doesn't get singled out. Because when Huhi is playing a utility mid laner, they can just fo focus Stixay down, try to outburst the utility, and then they're fine. Because the hyper carries really don't exist in the AD carry position right now. Mm -hmm. uh, Ash is kind of the closest that you get. Like Lucian's all early game, yeah. Sivir's all wave clear, and does eventually get like, like team fight status. Yeah. But it's not like Kogma. You don't have these things like Vayne right now. So you can't rely on a utility mid laner for your AD carry and be 100% okay. Mm -hmm. Well, now we're going to go ahead and send it down to Pastry, who's standing stage side for an interview with AD Carry's AD Carry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, I'm here with CLG Sticks. Hey, uh, congratulations once again on a series. You guys have been on a bit of a tear recently, but what happened in game one? Because uh, that looked a little crazy towards the end of that first one. Um, well, game one was pretty hectic. We had like really good control, and then uh, until we got the mid inhib, and then they baited us into fighting when we didn't want to. And we basically threw the game, and then even though like I felt like we were playing better than them, but they had TF, so anytime we like out rotated around, out rotated them around the map, they could just TF port on Darshan, and he just dies. So that's why we banned TF next game. Uh, I think we generally play pretty poorly versus that, so that's why we did it. But yeah, you guys had a pretty good series there, and you actually have been playing pretty well recently. Lots of Lucian, a bit of Sivir that game as well. You've been kind of back to your old aggressive ways. Do you feel more comfortable just kind of playing more aggressive and flashing forward a bit more? Um, I think about like two weeks ago. We just kind of had like a talk as a team, and we basically brought it down to like we are not trusting people as much. Uh, so for me, I would say that me and uh, Afro hadn't been working as well together as we normally do. So I think we just kind of bounce back, and I have a lot more trust in him now, uh, as he does in me. So and in general, I just have a lot more trust in my team, so I'm able to do stuff more comfortably, I guess. So. Yep. Well, you're going to need it as well because you have two huge matches coming up next week. We'll take them one by one. First of all, Cloud9 will be playing, I believe, on Sunday. What are your thoughts on that matchup and how you think you'll fare against that team? Um, well, I think Cloud9 is a pretty good team. They're on kind of like a downfall right now. So hopefully, uh, I, I would say we're on the, uh, the upswing as well. So I would say maybe we have an advantage. I don't know. But uh, it'll be a fun game. And then, of course, Immortals are the team you have to play before you get to play Cloud9. Obviously, a team that's looking very, very strong. You guys have already played TSM, so the number one team. How are you feeling against Immortals? Uh, Immortals is really good. They've always been really good. So it's going to be a really hard match. But last time we played them, we were able to take off a game. And we had a chance to win the series, but we just weren't good enough to close it out. So, But I think next time it'll be closer, a lot closer. So. And just generally, you guys have been, again, like on a bit of an upswing. How are you feeling kind of in the back third, back half of your season? Because it does feel like CLG kind of back on their feet again. Yeah, I mean, we have moments where we're kind of coming back, and then we have moments where it's like, oh, boy, here we go again. So I, we're definitely getting there, and we're, you can pretty much tell like we're improving and getting back to our, our form, I guess. But uh, we still have a lot of work to do, so... 
Well, best of luck. You guys have been playing great. Congratulations again on your win. Thank you so much for the interview, Stixay. But we're going to throw it back to the guys at the analyst desk. Thank you very much, Pastry Time. CLG sneak or snagging that victory after the uh, after the first loss to uh, Phoenix won here. So we'll be happy with it. And of course, the third game was the most dominant, just over 24 minutes for a victory. So uh, that was clinical. Yeah, definitely picked up pace throughout the series, where it was a loss, a win, and then a very quick win. So. Good to see from CLG that they kind of came together. And a lot of how they did it, obviously, was with their composition. The Cassiopeia coming up big for who he definitely stretching his champion pool a little bit, which is good to see in a mid lane focused meta uh, in which we know that he has struggled in the past. Well, one thing that wasn't good to see was the NAR. Again, first rotation <laughs> NAR. He played Aurelia two games in a row. He stomped the NAR every time. Can mm -hmm. we not take it again? We take NAR again. And right. we, even with all the pressure that Inori tried to put into the lane, even at that stage in the of around 20 minute mark, he got 1v1. So this is not a good matchup. And I feel like it's a lack of foresight from P1 and really understanding that this matchup is not going to go there very well. It only went well because of the Twisted Fate in the game one. So to say, all three games, blind picking the NAR before the Aurelia comes through in all three games. The only game in which it was successful was the one where they had the TF who could help in the side lane. Even then, it wasn't like it was a landslide yeah. victory in the no, side lane. No, he was still, still unable it was, to It was, yeah. we're hanging on by a thread here because yeah. of the TF in the side lane. So that's the thing. It's like, it, it, it clearly was not a working strategy. We didn't see the adjustment come out of Phoenix 1 in game three. They suffer for it, to say the least. Diving into some of the gameplay itself, since it was such a short one, 12 minutes in, we got a 3 for in the mid lane for CLG. This, this in and of itself blows the game wide open. Right, I mean, the game had been pretty even at this point. There have been some traded kills, and then here, after getting an initial pick onto the Karma, CLG makes a really decisive dive onto Zig and um, Gate, who's gonna walk up here, and just an instant flash ult from Huhi. They blow Gate up, and then from here, they're able to kind of push through these next couple turrets. And this, like you said, blew the game open, where it goes from a pretty even game to a couple thousand gold. Yeah, a couple kills, lots of global gold coming off of both the turret kills as well as the three, uh, the three pickups on the kills themselves. So for, pockets flooded with gold. CLG has entire control of the game. But the one thing I will say, the one thing I continue to love to see out of Phoenix One is the fact that they're trying things. The fact that they are making plays to get back in the games because some of our other teams that down there at the bottom of the table are not doing that. So at least this is a squad that says, okay, we got beat up. We got slapped in the face. We got, you know, the wind knocked out of us. Let's go again. Well, the key thing is that trying things is the first step to improving. If you're never going to try, you're never going to learn from the mistakes. So at least they're putting in the work necessary and the results will come after enough time. But it, this is why they've improved and starting to take some of the wins and getting out of that swamp that they were in. Right, they set up that death brush kind of in the top side where initially yeah. only went one for two and they picked up a couple more on at the tail end of that play. And just small things like that are really nice to see because it's not just them at the turret waiting for the wave to come in. They're trying to catch people in the rotation. And that's something that a lot of top teams actually do and them trying to model that and eventually they'll get a little better at it or maybe hopefully they're not down as much when they start that play, mm -hmm. which can obviously factor into it. So there's a lot of positives for P1, which is kind of what we were hoping to see in this series because we we were going to be surprised if they won it. Yeah, actually, that's it's kind of funny that we're coming full circle on this. We right. got a 2-1 series. Basically, what you and Dyrus were saying yesterday is the expectation is that CLG will win, but that we want to see Phoenix 1 put up a good fight. And they did just that. Even though this game finished in 24 minutes, the, the stabs that they made to get back into the game not working is what made the game end so quickly. But I'd rather them lose quickly and have made efforts to win the game than to lose slowly and have known they were going to lose the entire time. Right. I mean, a, t a ton of the top teams have that kind of mentality. You know, Team Liquid and Immortals being two who they're just going to keep going until they either get the lead back or they lose. Right. Exactly that. So 21 minutes into the game, we have a 3 for 0 for CLG at the red side. Blue buff. They're going to snag the Baron off that and then within three minutes they'll close So this the is game. a really great engage. They're looking for the pick onto the Bard, but unfortunately the Q from Bard mit from Braum misses and immediately they try to go into CLG on Six Smithy and they should just leave, but who he turns it around Another with a great massive from petrifying gaze. And it just lines up Sivir so perfectly. Right. All three in a row. The boomerang hits everybody, the ricochet, you can't flash out of the miasma. So this is just a really But nice this is that case, Mark, that we're talking about. Phoenix One is right. the initiator of this yes. fight. It was a good play. It wasn't they, yeah, it wasn't them like face checking a baron into a Cassio PS done. It was we almost caught this out. It was so close to being a play where they get a kill or two, which gives some gold back and stalls the game out. When they look at it back, they can think, okay, how can we have made this play a little bit better? Right. But in the future matches, if we're in the situation again, we can make sure that it happens, it works, and we can stall the game out. 
put ourselves closer to victory. Well, the man on the screen there that saved the play for CLG, who he is going to get our player of the game here on the Cassiopeia, and a lot of it in in part because of ults like that. Not afraid to be either the reinitiate, the turn, the counter initiate, or as in the first replay, the primary initiate with a flash ultimate. Well, when this series started, I was kind of disappointed with the whole supportive karma build in the mid lane. It's like, okay, you're going with a, a champion in the build that takes literally no skill. You just press R, E, or E, and W. Again, no skill shots here. And immediately transitions into the victor. Massive success. Immediately goes into the Cassiopeia, another champion that is relatively difficult to play. And he sees so much action with it, so much proactivity that it's refreshing to see, especially towards all the negativity towards his play. Right, and it's not just that you can play the Cassiopeia, but even though you don't like the Karma necessarily, at least you have multiple styles that you're willing to play, yeah. which puts a little bit more thought into the pick ban phase for enemy teams. Yeah, well, again, CLG, maybe this is the start of it. They've gotten into that six-win group in terms of the rest of the team, so still very much in contention for playoff spots, and then probably further. This was a good start for them. Phoenix won. It's great to see them still pressing hard on the back half of the split. We'll see what else they can do in future weeks. Time now to close things out on NALCS 1, which means we're sending you over to NALCS 2, where Game 3 between Team Liquid and Echo Fox is taking place. Roughly a 2K gold lead, a little bit more for Team Liquid at the 23-minute mark, 9 kills to 3. Let's see which of these teams is going to take the victory home to close out the day. Now can't do anything. He doesn't actually care that he's falling a bit behind on CS. Yes, he's losing some turrets. Yes, he's falling behind on CS. But he's moving around the map very actively. He's enabling his team to pick up these kills and get ahead. And that's what you have to do on Shen. You have to be putting your teammates in a position to carry. Because in the late game, you're not going to be bringing that damage in. Sivir with three kills. Uh, Phoenix with three kills on Victor. That's what you want. Well, a good juke away by Keith. Gets himself out of turret range. But Lurlo invincible the damage and just walks away after the attempted taunt. All but here's in. the chase in for Dardock. Vig is going to be dying on this one. He's got nowhere to go. A rampage now for Lorlo's Shen. Ten and three in this one. It's only a 2,000 gold lead. It's not catastrophic, but you're just seeing Echo Fox not find anything to do. A nice chair for Matt means the slow, means the taunt. And another kill now comes in for Fabi. 24 minutes in. Liquid looking maybe at Baron. They're going to be going for it, and KFO moving up here, trying to respond. They do not want to give over an early Baron. It will do a lot of damage to the team. Frog is going to try to cut them off. We'll see what they can get done. He's going to make them stick inside the Baron pit, and then gets a little bit of poke down on the map, but he's a pretty durable Cole drop. Coming in. Going across, map might die. The heal actually goes on the wrong champ, but doesn't go down to the ambient AoE, and there's the spike picked up. Dardot grabs it cleanly. KFO still taking damage, actually, from the Chaos Storm, but slinks away. Liquid, though, off a two for zero. Grab a clean Baron and a clean disengage. Good shot calling. Nice commitment to the Baron. No panic there from TL. Phoenix zones off the Gnar so he can't come in. Look for a big stun. And, you know, Matt gets low but does not go down critically. And here's how it started. The taunt already had landed on Keith. Yes, he got away, but Dardock is here. In he goes with the ultimate. Lands the fear onto Big. He's going to go down, and the chase will continue. They're so fast at chasing him down with the ghost with the E from Hecarim, and now Kez gets caught. Flash Q there from Matt means there's no way for him to get out. Another taunt lands there for Lorlo. Fabi picking up the kills, and they are just getting huge. But still, the gold is pretty close yeah. because there have been extra turrets for Fox. There has been extra CS. We'll see how much of that, though, TL can take back with Baron. Yeah, TL getting it with the Baron pickup, the mid lane tier two going down, and the eight kill lead. They've sustained 4,000. The lead is something you can take Sever over. Ulti. Good dodge by Keith gets away. An ultimate down from Fabi means not much else, except, well, there's a nice little red buff steal. <laughs> Fabi's not going to be allowed to get this one. Dardock says, I am the carry. Give me all the buffs. And this is going to be a top lane turret going down. The Baron, of course, meaning quite a lot as KFO does some battle with Lorlo in the bottom side of the map, and he did go Frozen Pallet. He may Pallet. actually be able to chase him down. We'll see if he can make it happen, but the minions are going to be too much. Has to back off, and Froggen's getting caught. Look at that damage from Dardock. Solo kill from Dardock. It's probably going to happen. Yep. There's the Onslaught of Shadows. Goodbye. This one feels much better than Game 2 did for the Liquid Jungler. Just brutal. No escape. For Frog and his Dardock follows with the ultimate and TL closing in here, looking to finish this game up. You can see Lorlo's waiting in base. He wants to go in. They want to close it out. Yeah, this could be the game very soon. The match to boot when it happens. 
top lane inhibitor gone already. So much gain during this Baron buff. Still a minute 20 to go on that one. A push in on towards Keith and a half HP on him. Cocoon hits Matt. Froggen though still not alive. There's no Tali to help fight back. It's a three me. versus four. A lot of damage. Bing's got a flash to get back to his fountain, but the turrets are still falling. Liquid not stopping whatsoever. They gotta wait for a wave now, so they will slowly have to And Lord pause. won't let KFO base. He's just basically trying to harass him, keep him there. Guys with the flash cocoon. And the re-ult from Fabio, it actually means mostly nothing as KFO can use to do battle. Killing coming across, bit of damage out of Frog, and but Dardock wants in, pushing him across. A little bit of damage. Root's gonna land that. Actually, Will gonna pick up on a Dardock. It'll go through the Shen ulti. So now Lorlo can't really join the team. Phoenix dangerously low, but Keith can't get the kill. He's got a flash away. Even the Elise bounce, not quite gonna do enough. Frog but maybe Echo Fox can get it. A slow one to Fabi to pick off from big. Echo Fox managed to grab two kills. Will they get a third they're looking for, but they can't reach the opponents. The Ocean Drake actually helping Liquid run away and get their health bars back, but Echo Fox actually with the Cloud Drake might get back into attack range. To be honest, Fabi's ulti's not up. Yeah, they just have to tag them once. Froggen has the bonus move speed, Karma shields, and he has the Rylize. If he lands one spell, they could get the kills. We'll see if they can do it. Repel comes in. get in front of him, and there's the hit coming across. Looking for the kill, oh, no! The turn Phoenix turns it back around, but they do trade back onto Fabi. Now, is there a flank for Phoenix? No, there's not. His Rylize slows decent enough, a one for one, but Echo Fox into the game now with no enemy AD carry. And that's why Cloud Drake's good sometimes. They do hold on though, and it all starts off with the Flash Cocoon. Phoenix, they're not able to follow it up, but in goes Frog and he locks them locks into the Fabby. base. And really nice job, Fabi cannot participate. It is a 4v3 here. They pick up the kill on Dardock. Shen ulti too little too late. Phoenix almost going down to Keith, but look at that trade back of damage, and he has to retreat, and now it is the Rylai's slow. Tags Matt means there's no chance for him to get away. And then, yeah, the slow, long rechase in as KFO was battling Volo the whole time, but didn't get all that much done. The turret score yeah. still four for Echo Fox. Looking quickly at that bottom inhibitor turret, not really hurt very much. 2,800 of 3,300 health. Not anything substantial done from KFO aside from mm -hmm. You know, keeping Lorlo down in that lane. A lot of CS up though for Keith, a lot of CS up for KFO, and that is why they're still relevant in the game. They are down 5,000 gold though, very significant. One inhibitor has been cracked, and Gnar, although it's a great split pusher, you're not really slaughtering these super minions. It's tough to actually continuously clear that out, and TL are looking to press the advantage. They yeah. want to crack the base. And interestingly, because of the farm differences and whatnot, the actual gold lead per player is all about 1,000 individually. Yeah. It's very spread out. Even though Lolo has all these kills, there's so much farm on KFO, he's matched that gold for the most part. So it's just small, sort of diffuse advantages for Liquid if they can make something more happen. A great turret kill adds more gold to every one of their players' pockets. Looking now at the bot lane inhibitor turret. Top of is dead. Damage the on the Fabi. He's really out. low. And yeah, they've locked out half the team, but Lorlo's taking the front side. They zone out Phoenix as well. A nice knockoff out of map, but here comes a couple of stuns. KFO flashes to get the stun on map, but that's not enough because Jarduck is here, and he wants KFO. Stun's going to land, but the shield keeps him alive. Big a fear comes back in. Doesn't lock in many, but it will be the kill on the KFO. They've actually picked up Keith first. A one for zero, a nice fight for Liquid turning it around. KFO revives, and he's popped as well. That's two now for Liquid. Five feet three, and the health bars are big enough to keep the play going. Dardock came up huge there. Five man Hecarim ulti lands the fear on everyone. Fox gets completely scattered, and not only do they get two kills, they get the GA from KFO, and they are looking to close it out. There's a flash taunt available for Lorlo. Will he go for it? Bit of a chance that Wave Clear Lorlo stunned up. Dardock still very injured, honestly. Frog Echo Fox to have one of their major carries. The, the flash. flash taunt comes in. Frog and dangerous, and he is dead. It's now a 5v2. Liquid looking to close it out. Keith! Oh, sorry, it's big, but he goes down. Phoenix picks it up. Nicely done. Now only Kez stands between Echo Fox and defeat. It's Liquid looking to win this one right now. 5 versus 1. Now 5 versus 2. Keith has come back up, but they might make the dive happen. KFO a lot arrives and alive as well. They've picked Matt up one. Down. It's Matt going down, they might be able to save this one, but a turret has dropped, an ulti in, and yes, Dardock gets a kill, but it's only a trade. The uh, neck is low. now left open, Fabi chased in, but the gravity well picks him up, and it gets all of them, and that's gonna be the win. It's Liquid taking down a hard-fought series. It was tight the whole time through, but that's the Nexus, that's the game, and Liquid hold on to a strong record. Close game there for Liquid, and I think it's a lot closer of a series than they were hoping for. They do close it out off the back of some big plays, and 5-0-2 is the scoreline there for Lorlo. He was 
instrumental in not only creating the lead, but in getting those picks that help to end the game. And you know, Dart off with the five man ulti in the bot lane. Phoenix, as always, huge in the late game on Victor. Absolutely the case. So Liquid pulling out a hard fought match win, improving them to seven wins, which keeps them tied with Cloud9, a team they've already beaten once and will play again over in the ninth week to try to get a better seed for themselves. And they've got to try to stay in that top of the pack because there's basically seven teams right now looking at playoff standings. And one of those isn't going to make it, of course. And Echo Fox, to talk about them, do look somewhat better. I mean, Liquid Odyssey would be one of their very toughest opponents yeah. in the entire league. And to play them close is actually heartening. It's one of those losses where you can look at and say, okay, yes, you're not the best team in the league. That wasn't a big surprise. But actually playing close against the top team Maybe it looks better next week. I also have to give them credit for battling back after a devastating first game loss where they got slaughtered. That game was not even close. Yeah. It was 26, 27 minutes. They lost by 15,000 gold lead. And in game two, not only did they play it closer, they actually win and they look very good doing it. Game three, it was a closely fought contest. I think that you know, Liquid in the end kind of out executed, outplayed them a bit yeah. uh, in some of those key matchups. And KFO was never really able to carve out the advantages that he needed. Yes, Nar is a pusher. Yes, Nar can get these advantages, but you're not someone like the Aurelia, like the the Fiora, that's just able to easily solo kill a Shen. Right. You don't really push it any farther forward, yeah. especially with how much uh, Lorla was part of these fights, the Stand United, the Teleports. Was he was part of almost every single kill his team ever got. And despite being outlaned and counterpicked, he had a gold lead the whole time because of how well he was able to team play. And it was really nice to see you know, a player that had been getting a lot of flack, honestly, from Liquid, one of the, the weak links on the team, having a, a sort of a carry performance here on this Shen, where he, I think, almost never died the whole time. And and had it, a good performance. Yeah, no deaths. 5 0 12. Yeah, very 17 out of 20 and, uh, for KP. Yeah, so impressive. But also just the fact that he's playing it proactively, not yes. reactively. That's how Shen should be played. Yes. I, I really get frustrated sometimes watching this. It's one of the <laughs> champions that I play like more than anything else. And right. uh, it's it's one of the champions that really excels at making plays. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wait for the plays to come to you and then just alt in and save your team. Yeah. You can just team up with the Hecarim, with these aggressive divers, alt exactly. in aggressively and make the plays happen. You have two globals, they have one. So even if you TP in, they match you, you do it again, do it again right after. That's how you collect the advantages. And and Lorlo displayed this incredibly in this game. Absolutely agree. When Liquid looks good, they look like that, where it's yeah. Lorlo and Dardock. Dardock calling the shots, diving in, getting the backup, and making the team win. So a wonderful game three win, a close one, but still a victory nonetheless here for Liquid. And now we have Rivington on stage standing by for post-game interview with Liquid's top laner. So take it away. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Great cast on the day. I am joined by Team Liquid's Lorlo after their win over Echo Fox. A fantastic win at that. I do have to ask you, though, it seemed like the bird was the word in the second game. You guys couldn't get by it. What was the communication like for Liquid to right the wrongs there and come back in game three? Um, I think after second game, we were all like pretty tilted, but we just like regrouped and made sure we didn't like tilt off the face of the, uh, face of the earth and just regrouped, refocused, and just had a good draft for game three and just played it out. It seemed like the draft synergized very well. I got to ask you, coming out with the Shen in the top, with a 5-0-12 or something, that game as well, strong in game number one and three. What has changed about your play? Because you're a different player from spring to now. It seems like there's a lot more confidence behind that. Yeah, I think uh, in terms of my play, I've been like getting way more confident in my own play and also just like having the synergy with Dardock, it's always easy to make plays around the map. So in terms of me transitioning to more of a carry player as well, it's, it's more comfortable for me. So yeah, it's just like transitioning myself from one role to the other for the team is also a really good thing for us. Well, I'm sure the fans are happy and it's also been fantastic for, fantastic for anybody to see the flash plays and all the hard work you've been putting in the top lane. Final question, TSM and Cloud9 come in the following weeks, but there's energy, other teams in their trap games. How is Liquid going to approach the following and rest of the summer split? Um, I think we still have like tons of things to work on. Like even this series was like really shaky for us and we weren't happy with the mortal set yesterday, even though we took a game off them. So in terms of like going into the next week and just uh, future weeks, we're just gonna look to polish up our 2v1, polish up our yeah, just macro game in general and just look to go strong into the playoffs. Lorlo, thank you very much once again. Great games. And now we're gonna throw it over to the analyst desk to break down the rest of the day. Thank you very much, Riv. Team Liquid getting the victory here. 2-1 over Echo Fox. It was hard fought, definitely. Uh, 
it's interesting just because we have this discussion about them being a top three team and then if occasionally we do see them plagued by mistakes that definitely separate them from the likes of Immortals and TSM as a squad. I think the big thing in this series was just like the game two draft was really bad and you don't see other teams having that bad of a draft. There's like maybe a miss pick here too that doesn't quite work the way we wanted but like they this series actually game one and three was pretty decisive in my mind. It, right. was, it wasn't super close. It was game two where it was just like what was that? And, and you can't afford to have that when you start playing against these top teams because you might, the other games aren't going to be that close. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think that statement or that point is echoed by what Lorlo just said. He's like, we, you know, we still, even within this series uh, against the, the last place LCS team, had many things that we could work on. So as a squad, of course, they also recognize that there's many improvements to be made. Uh, but when you are making mistakes against the bottom tier team, that's yeah. definitely where you need to, okay, we got to clean that up first before we can even shoot for the stars on uh, TSM or Immortals. Well, I think a lot of it comes down to not the simplicity of the issue. Obviously, they do have a lot to work on. I trust Lurlo's word on that because a lot of the things that happened in this game were spiraled by Echo Fox's lack of proactivity, mm -hmm. misposition, not really trying anything, getting caught out of position, which makes a map a lot easier to be played when they're just kind of handing you the opportunities left, right, and center. Whereas you play against a top team, Natalia is going to try to influence the map. The dual lane isn't going to get, you know, present themselves everywhere. It's just please dive me, please kill me. Right. I think when you look at this draft, both teams kind of have an obvious, like, we're going to play this way style. Right. We, they, uh, game two, we said they should pick the heck room with the Shen to give him a dive, buddy. They switch out the victory and Karma as well, but basically Team Liquid's comp is like, we're going to destroy your bot lane over and over if you leave them exposed. Yes. And they execute on their game plan. When you look at Fox, it's, we should try and snowball our Gnar, we should get Talia going up there, maybe three men die, sack our bot lane a little bit, and we didn't really see that many, like, trades of kills where both people are using globals to different places or something, or anything really like that. It seemed like one team executed the game plan and one couldn't. Well, we didn't even see any kills for a a solid portion of the game, right? right? And I think that's what's kind of frustrating when you see Talia picked in the mid lane. And earlier today, we had two very clear examples of a Talia owning the lane phase, affecting the side lanes, creating fights, you know, changing terrain, for, you know, forcing bad decisions. That didn't happen here. And that speaks back to your point of inaction from Echo Fox. You have this champion that excels when you are proactive with it. Well, I then think that didn't take place. Again, we've we talked about the issues with Echo Fox. It's got to be that confidence. The fact that they're, the players just aren't trusting each other to, to say, hey, if I put resources on you, can I trust you to win the game for me? And that's just not happening here. Right. They won the second game because mainly from the draft. The fact that the liquid composition just couldn't really do anything against a singular Anivia pick. But if Echo Fox isn't willing to even try and put trust in one of their teammates and their progress is going to stagnate and that's what's happened for all these weeks. Yeah, very much so. Let's take a look at some of the fights that took place throughout this game. 15-30 into the game. Team Liquid picks up three for one. Up to this point, there had only been one kill in the game. So it was slow moving, at least for the early stages. But Team Liquid going to snag themselves a solid advantage here. Right, I think the thing to look at is like, the Fox bot lane's a little pushed up in the long lane, so Team Liquid makes a very forced bot lane dive, not even really dive, just play on it. If you look to mid lane just prior to this, uh, Froggen had pushed in uh, Phoenix all the way into his turret and was trying to like harass him under turret rather than swinging top and trying to make a play. And I think that's the big difference in these teams that you need to look for. Like here they're able to, to start collapsing, but if this fight started a lot earlier, it's not a three for one, it's it's a two for two, or maybe even a three for one for their favor. But they're, instead of taking that pressure that Froggen had and moving around the map, he, he looks more like he's harassing. And that's the big difference. When Bjergsen had the pressure, he was topside making that Rumble's life hell. Yeah. You didn't see that <laughs> for like Shen was not pressured not the same well. Ray yeah, yeah I didn't know I want to be at Ray at all. That looked like the most miserable top lane experience of your life. But uh, yeah, exactly that, right? And so here we have Team Liquid finally finding their advantage 15-30 into the game. And they are a team that can, for the most part, smartly play out a lead if they have one, right? So against the top team, sometimes they struggle securing that lead. But here they've got the lead. They're going to continue putting the pressure on 24 minutes into the game. Two for O plus a Baron. That's all they're going to need to seal the deal. Yeah, this is a situation where Fox has pushed up all the way into the turret against this kind of global comp. You can't really afford to sit in front of a turret when they have so much chase down with the Hecarim and the Sivir. So this is, is just hovering around the lane too long, especially when the Gnar hasn't pushed in yet either. They can't afford to just push in one lane at a time. And they get chased down here. Great cue from Matt to slow down Kez, picking up the kill, which basically makes the Baron free. Yeah, very much so. No contest here. No chance of a steal like we've seen a couple times throughout this weekend. Well, the thing is, a composition like the one that Team Liquid is running is one that requires a certain level of macro understanding when you play against it to be able to 
effectively counter it. This composition can be countered simply by macro play. One of the easiest things to do is just never lane. So you always just lane swap when you put the dual lane constantly versus the top lane so that the Shen can't influence the dual lane, which is what they're trying to do. So if you never give them that opportunity, it never happens. But that requires a constant flow of communication between every single member of the team, understanding what the lane assignment is, what the warding, the cooldowns, and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And I thought that it was really smart from Team Liquid to pick something that you know that Fox is not going to have the macro answer to. Yeah, that's that's uh, I love that point. I'm so glad you brought that up. And I just want to expand on that now, kind of across all teams, the idea idea that you know there are different levels of execution that are required by any team composition that you craft in League of Legends, right? You could choose the Leona, this is not a composition that would ever be crafted in competitive That's play. How you but start. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just saying like, but this is obvious, right? So right. you have Leona as a support, you've got an Annie in the mid lane, you've got a Malphite in the top lane. Like the it's very obvious that this team just wants to group, die, we'll dive you under a turret, doesn't matter, we have tons of AoE damage and lots of go buttons, right? So that's how they that's a very binary yet you know team composition. Then you have things like what Echo Fox crafted here, and as you just mentioned, this is less about the actual execution or landing of a couple of different abilities in combo with each other. This is more about now how we operate around the map as a team and play it strategically. And if your team doesn't excel in that area, I would never suggest that you craft that kind of composition. Team Liquid rightly understanding that, okay, if we just pick something that does have a very uh, direct approach to winning this game, Fox is not going to be able to keep us split or running around the map they Which the way they want. Which ties into the previous series, actually, of CLGP1, of CLG being unable to respond to a macro a champion like TF that you have to respond in the macro sense. So it very much applies to pretty much every single team. And I'd like to see more understanding of that concept from the lower level teams. We'll see if they can and can grasp that by the end of the split. Player of the game going to lower low here, as we heard him interviewed just moments ago. 5, 0, and 12 on that Shen, 85% kill participation. So definitely uh, picking his game up here in game three. It's a better feeling getting a scoreline like that than getting a bunch of kills. So yeah. when you're playing a tank and you don't die, Always the best. Right, especially given the comp he was against, you think that he would be a heavy focus given the counter pick of the Nar versus him, yeah. as well as having the Talia come in with global pressure. The fact that he doesn't die in a game where he's probably the most susceptible person in his team is, is extremely impressive. Yep, so Team Liquid once again picking up the victory here in a 2-1, both of our second series of the day ending in 2-1, but that just makes that middle pack all that much more interesting, especially with the CLG victory as well. With the week at a close, let's see how, or rather, which players took home the most player of the game honors. Huni, Huhi, KFO, and Pyrian are the heroes of the, of the week, each earning two player of the game awards, with 11 other players walking away with one additional mention. Now let's take a peek at how those awards have influenced the leaderboard. TSM's Dane in the mid lane, Bjergsen is on top of the heap, with eight awards followed by teammate Doublelift and Immortals members Huni and Poe Belter with seven. And of course, we've got a slew of Team I mean, Liquid players to follow. It's got to be in the colors, because there's a very obvious color palette going on <laughs> there. The, the blue and the blues green. and the seafoam greens. Yeah. Uh, anything yeah, I think ocean, water related. Yeah. Huhi, number one for CLG for player of the game. So everyone else kind of has like one or two there, and then mm -hmm. Huhi's by himself. And I've never been on a team with those colors. Yeah, would it just yellow? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> now okay, that that's out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Uh, no, no, I, uh, I, that is an interesting point. It's, I think it's even more intriguing the fact that players like Poe Belter and Huhi, two players that we didn't necessarily look at as playmakers in previous splits, are snagging in these Player of the Game awards. And hey, in part and due because they're stepping up. And then the other aspect of it is that as meta shifts, obviously different roles become more and less important and or flashy even if you don't want to use the word important because all roles are integral to a team comp. It's certain ones are going to thrive or... or be spotlighted a bit more than others. Yeah, I think right now we can see that mid lane is one of the highlights of the draft for a lot of teams. It's either first picking the OPs or getting counter picks or in situationally strong ones like the global Talia and TF. Right, exactly. All right, well, earlier today we invited you at home to show us how you're watching the LCS on Twitter, and we got a ton of great responses, photo responses. So here are some of our favorites. First up, at Squidosaurus Rex sends an adorable photo with a simple message, hashtag TSM win. Starting them early there. Right there, no choice in fandom. It's never for, too young to be like. Yeah, that baby looks like it's <laughs> pretty excited. It's yelling or yawning it's or yeah, yawning. Maybe or the game's asking for the food. Is he excited? Well, TSM dominates the way they do. Maybe you do get bored watching. Uh, watching. Do you get bored watching your team win that? Much? As a Patriots asking, fan, <laughs> as a Patriots fan, I can say sometimes you're kind of like, when's the postseason start? Like, when right. do I, when do I, I need a real competition? Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. 
I, that's easy. I, yeah, like from watching, from what you I like watching my team win, but I like watching my team win in close in in, in close games. Right? I mean, I want there to be a little bit of fear. There's a little bit of like pompous satisfaction in knowing that you don't need to worry at all. But <laughs> in terms of day to day, hour to hour, I wish those games were a little closer. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, next up, Chase and Walls is working hard, but still had the time to share this photo. And that's some serious dedication. As soon as it pops up, we're going to see it. Boom, there it is. Um, we've got... I can't imagine watching League of Legends and oh, operating a sharp blade is the smartest of ideas, but I do respect the commitment Whoa, to competitive League I'm, of Legends. He can clearly multitask. Well, so. I mean, yeah, I mean, the cuts are pretty good, right? I'm, so. I'm more concerned about the tomato juice near the phone. Like, I trust this guy with the knife and all <laughs> that, but, like, the, the sanitation maybe, right. the whole just getting your phone messy. No like, water damage, please. Yeah, I know. I don't if you're a juice. good enough cook, you can cut it without the juice going everywhere. Are you a good cook, Crumbs? Sure. I feel sure. 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 Yeah. Convince yeah. That's the yeah. answer. I, can I make want food my that you won't like. But I, will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can uh, heat up a bag of chicken. <laughs> okay. Right. Next up, Courtney Zam is cheering on Phoenix One with a guest tweeting, "Watching LCS with my corgi. She's rooting oh. for a P1 win." Well, unfortunately, that one didn't come through, but they did put up a big fight. Corgis are adorable. There's no denying that. Is this after? Because that Corgi looks particularly sad. He's looking no, no, like a very he's like, he's, like, right he's like, I can't look. I can't look. No, they're in champ select. Yeah, yeah. I think oh, that's, yeah, game right. that's game one champ select. Is it? I, I don't yeah, know I if it's it game is. one. It's I'm game not going to invest Yeah, you can see this, this, this blurb it's is game. clearly... That's the NAR. That's the NAR. <laughs> that's I'm the NAR. They've NAR all three games. No, no. Braum, Braum, Rex. I'm going to move us on to our last one now. Finally, at Wellington CP is one of our international partners bringing the LCS to a French-speaking audience. And they've got a cool setup we wanted to share. So this is actually uh, in part the co control room that is broadcasting the North American LCS out to our French-speaking audience. So a uh, good little insight on how they operate. That's O Gaming uh, would be the uh, organization. But fun little setup there. Riv and uh, Azale, I believe, off on the right screen. Good to see those I'm guys. I'm surprised you know that's Azale. Looks like a ghost. And you white. need to get your eyes checked. You can't see the channel select. You can't. It's a Zale. Yeah. I'm too close. It's just pixels. Right. I just see a million. Oh, it's Riv and Kobe. So ah. I actually was wrong. Uh, yeah. As I also yeah, just kick something yeah, off the desk. We are you. we are falling apart here <laughs> and digressing as we do every weekend now with these three three days of games. Let's take a look at the league standings updated with results from week six. TSM in first place has now clinched a playoff spot. Immortals are still in second place, and we've got a third place tie between Cloud9 and Liquid. CLG is fifth alongside Team Envy and the bottom four teams in order, Apex, Energy, Phoenix One, and Echo Fox. Now time to look ahead to next week 